Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, members and guests, um, of whom there are loads today. Um, right, item one is uh, apologies for absence and chairman's announcements. I received apologies from Assemblymember Duval and Assemblymember O'Connell for him. Assemblymember Devonish is substituting. Everyone else appears to be here. Um, did we get, an, uh, did we get a uh, substitute for Assemblymember Duval? Or is it no, late? No, no, chairman. I think Tom Devonish is this morning. Tom and I are in a substantive members. We're here. Right? We're okay. here. Well, fortunately the house won't fall down now, so uh, <laughs> we can keep it all going. Splendid. Um, item two is declarations of interest. Can we note the list of offices held by members and are there any disclosable pecuniary interests in addition to those we wish to make at this time? So that was no. Item three is the minutes uh, of the meeting on the 15th of November. Can they be signed by me as a correct record? No. Thank you. Item four is a summary list of actions. Uh, can we note the completed and outstanding actions arising from previous meetings of the Oversight Committee? Okay, now members will be familiar with my usual practice of taking papers as read unless we have evidence gathering. Uh -huh. uh, today I'm not going to do that. Uh, I think there are papers on here that are of particular interest to members, particularly as we build up towards the budget. So in each case uh, I'm going to ask the relevant officers to introduce them uh, and members can then ask whatever questions they want in the usual way. So the first one is the staffing implications of the 2019-20 GLA budget. Mm -hmm. uh, lead officer is uh, the new head of pay service. Mary, would you like to introduce yes. the paper? Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very short paper, so I was going to make it a very short introduction. Uh, as you saw in the budget, um, the draft budget proposals, there are a number of staffing implications of the budget, and I've just summarised them in this short paper uh, and organised them into what seems to me at least a reasonable programme of consultation to come back to the committee with. So I lay out, in fact, what you're seeing today, but also what I propose to bring January, February and March uh, to fulfil my consultation obligations to you. Well, I think, members, for, for your benefits, the, as, as the head of paper has just said, <coughs> also just said um, three of these uh, papers are being considered in today's agenda in, as substantive items. Uh, the others will be done on the 30th of January, so I suggest that those ones we wait until we get the, the, the full paper. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to ask questions about the three that are coming to us today, we do that at that time. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so, can we note this particular report? Mm -hmm. And then we'll go into the first of these um, proposed changes, which is item six. Mm -hmm. And this relates to the um, technology group. And David Munn is going to yeah, Sorry, um, I'd like to ask a question on item five. I think you can correct me if I'm got it wrong or right. Um, no, oh, sorry, going to go on to technology group. Yes. Oh no, sorry, carry on. Yeah, sorry. Okay. okay. So, um, David, um, you're going to outline the proposal on uh, paper six. The, uh, the paper outlines the the fact that we've got a number of pressures on the technology group at the moment. They fall into broadly two categories. One is that we've taken on, we will be taking on responsibility for delivering services for the London Legacy Development Corporation in the new year. And the other is the fact that we've been dealing with uh, increased demand within City Hall for services. And there's a number of uh, reasons for that. One is the increased number of users that we're providing support to. Another is the, re is the increased number of digital projects that we've got responsibility for but also uh, the increased number of mobile devices, which has been exacerbated as we've moved to a much more of a flexible working approach, as the desk ratio has, uh, uh, the number of staff to desk ratio has increased, and the, the demand for both mobile services and flexible working has been increasing. And so, um, uh, and I think the paper lays out uh, the posts that relate to the LLDC and meeting the demand <coughs> are in this paper and then there'll be uh, other resources that will be looked at as part of the technology transformation work that will be coming in the new year, which will be in another paper. Okay, members, that was the introduction. Any questions on that? I just so that I'm clear, so that I'm clear in terms of what's written here. Mm -hmm. um, you're saying that these posts will come ring, ring, ring post to an area, certainly the LLDC posts. Yes, the LLDC ones will, because they will be 
they have to be funded by the LLDC. Yeah. So the and, and what makes you so certain that one post to the LLDC is adequate and will not then draw resource <coughs> from the already under pressure services that you provide to City Hall and elsewhere? Uh, yeah. We've had to do quite a bit of work on making sure that we've got, the, that we've got this right. We've been doing due diligence looking at uh, the types of calls that the LLDC have been dealing with. Mm. And, uh, but you're right. I mean, part of, the, of why you have a shared service is that, is that clearly at some point there may be some sharing of that, of that resource. Mm. But you have to be able to make some sort of call about what you consider the additional demand will be and uh, trying to put some resources in place to be able to meet that. Mm. Just, just I, to be I, clear, I, David, I, on that, so to, to, to clarify that answer, is it one post or anything? No, no, that, sorry. I'm my reading of the paper. No, no, no. There's uh, seven posts yeah. which relate to the LLDC. And the LLDC are making a financial contribution of 300 out of That's 184,000. Right. That's right. Oh, That's for, right. for one post, equivalent to one. No, um, it's a shared service, so there's oh, not a okay. ring fence post to the LLDC. I think okay. what David was saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. is that um, because we're taking on the responsibility for, for technology LLDC. for the LLDC, right. we need more posts. Right. But yeah. they're not ring fenced to them, it goes into the shared pot. Into yeah, that, that, that's right. I mean, clearly, we've had to make an assessment about how many resources we'll need to be able to deliver the, the service for them. I mean, our expectation is that we're talking about an increase in demand of our services of about 30% as we take that service on. So clearly that will mean a substantial increase in resources to be able to deliver that. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, th I think it was worth asking mm. so that we have it on record that you've done, as you say, do, do due diligence. Okay, so remember Devonish. Um, bearing in mind that IT is kind of a niche area and you're competing in London against every other major organisation, would it be better to actually outsource a contract and get an external provider in rather than try and hire people in that very competitive market and do it yourself? Um, well, the LLDC are making a decision here that this offers better value for money for them than going... I mean, what they've been doing is they've, they've been doing just that. They've been using an outsourced IT provider for the last three or four years. To no, but I'm asking you as the GLA, not, not, not another part of the GLA. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'd be better off going to the market at least to benchmark what you're trying yeah. to do before you decide to take on 10 members of staff? Yeah, no, uh, well, I think we have been doing that. I mean, we do not provide all of our IT services in-house anyway. It's sort of like a, a hybrid type service. So where we don't feel that we're able to deliver the best possible service, for example, in digital delivery and that, that's, that sort of thing, we bring in external parties to be able to deliver that. But certainly, um, uh, when we did the market testing, looking at us compared with the private sector and being able to deliver this service for the LLDC, we were considerably cheaper than the, than the private sector. And that's the reason why the LLDC and us are going down this route. Have you, so have you shared that uh, paper with the committee before, oh. in terms of market versus your own costs? Uh, the paper... The, uh, a year or so ago, we put up a paper about the fact that we were going to go down this, uh, we were going to go down this route, and part of that talks about the fact that, in comparison with the market testing that the LLDC have done about looking at uh, uh, who they want to take on as a service provider, that we are cheaper than that. Could you share, that, could you share that paper? I'd say I'm quite dubious yeah. about that. Well, um, what that. So what that paper is, is a comparison between what the costs are currently of the LLDC getting their service through an external provider with the cost of us being able to provide that service. And at the moment, our estimate of that is that were the LLDC to go out at the moment and, and go through their existing service provider to provide that service, the cost of that would be about £200,000 more than it would be of us providing that That's not place. exactly what you said earlier. I was asking you about benchmarking broadly to the market, and you just told me that you've gone no, back to your one service supplier at LLDC at the moment and said you've done yeah, the figures that right. way. What, we, what hasn't been done is sort of like what the LLDC didn't do when they approached us about this was to do market testing across the whole of the you know to, uh, across the whole of London to see whether there were alternative ways of being able to do this. But what they did do was talk to their providers about what the cost of their service would be and asked us whether we could match that cost 
Which I'll leave it here, Chairman, yeah. but I think perhaps it'd be worth a bit further exploring whether they should go out and try and benchmark because, you know, 10 extra people is a lot of resource. Is, is there actually a, a, a business case paper that's been put really? together? There is, there is. Okay. I mean, that uh, could that be I shared think, with the committee. Which I think came to Oversight Committee uh, about a year ago. Right, so it's buried in one of the previous agendas. Yeah. Can, we, can we dig that out and say, okay, to members, please? Um, okay. Uh, I saw something on the shot. Yeah, in. Uh, your uh, note about current business priorities to oversee change program. There's a reference to e-counting aspect. Can you tell us more about uh, uh, recruitment there? And uh, is this also to do with uh, a project manager uh, post, which was talked about when we last had presentation on uh, e sort of uh, counting process, an independent project manager? Is that me to answer that? Or am I mixing yes. two separate things? Yeah. Well, so the um, so as you heard from me last time, and I was here with my other hat on, uh, we were um, procuring the yeah. provider, external provider of the e count services. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in fact, I was going to write to to you all separately to tell you who we have now procured for that, because that was announced. Uh, we signed the contract a couple of days ago. On top of that, coming out of the recommendations of the Assembly after 2016, was the recommendation that we appoint somebody uh, independent yes. of that provider to be uh, the GLAs and the, and the ROs, eyes and ears within the provider. And we have interviewed for that role now. And we have a preferred candidate who I am meeting before Christmas. And so we always complete that at yeah. the moment. I think what this paper also is referring to as well is that people in David's team, being the GLA's IT team, also yeah. have an important role uh, in supporting me as the RO with the e-count yeah. um, system and particularly how it plays out here at City Hall in the City Hall part of the count. That's right. E-count is... Three different pieces. Yeah. E e involved in the additional system. posts? No. Is the next question. No, no, there isn't. No. We don't intend to have. So it's like just that within the current system, this is one of your priority. That's right. That's what you're telling That's us. Right. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Any other member on this report? Okay. Uh, we are asked to respond to the report. Well, I think we've asked questions. Shall we agree to note the report? Yeah. Yep. No, Thank yeah. you, members. Okay, item seven is the proposed changes relating to growth infrastructure and connectivity. Jeremy, I believe you're going to introduce report. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, members. Um, yes, this is a proposal to add uh, five full-time equivalent uh, resources to the GLA's existing growth infrastructure and connectivity unit. The posts would be uh, funded externally uh, via the uh, lane rental uh, charge funding pot, which is administered by TfL and overseen by the various utilities <coughs> uh, who uh, dig up the streets periodically in London. And the uh, aim of that fund um, by regulation is to reduce congestion and the other adverse effects of street works. Uh, and the proposal is to establish this unit to assist with the coordination of infrastructure and development works uh, across the capital uh, to achieve uh, that objective. Um, the proposal is that a couple of the officers would work with local authorities on the ground identifying um, areas where, for instance, street works um, could be undertaken in a collaborative way. Uh, another officer would be uh, assessing uh, the data uh, at the um, uh, Pan London level. We are uh, we have already achieved a um, data agreement with all the major utilities across uh, London uh, such that they provide data to us on their planned uh, works um, and then a couple of supporting officers um, for, for that primary uh, resource. Um, to give an example of a project um, happening on the ground at the moment in Croydon, uh, we're working with the council Thames Water and Southern Gas Networks to try and reduce uh, the amount of time one road is closed off um, by uh, getting those two uh, main um, uh, utility suppliers to, to work uh, together. 
Um, and um, this has clearly been something we have achieved at scale before, but notably during the build up to the 2012 games. But uh, since then, it has been relatively sporadic. What is new is that um, we have formed uh, a body called the Mayor's Infrastructure High Level Group, where we have the chief execs and chairs and directors of the major utility companies um, that periodically meet and can uh, both oversee um, and um, uh, move forward with the collaborative works that we have proposed. We developed uh, a business case for them, which we submitted to that group in April uh, last year, and that was unanimously endorsed. Uh, we then um, made the Lane Rental Fund application in August of this year, uh, again where the proposal was uh, endorsed, and we now uh, are essentially in the, uh, the process uh, with your uh, blessing um, to establish that new that resource within the GLA. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, right, I've seen Assembly Members uh, Devonish and Arnold in order. Assembly Member Devonish. Um, Jeremy, I was surprised you, you virtually said it was sort of a unanimously agreed. I chaired a meeting with my Westminster City Council hat on only the other week, uh, and there were certainly mutterings that if you've already got TFL uh, man marking, or should I say person marking uh, the industry and indeed the bubbers involved in this, is this just not a lower, another level of bureaucracy we don't require? Well, in some cases, TfL <coughs> also need to be encouraged to coordinate. Um, so, in an ideal example, for instance, we would um, see, um, uh, say, taking a stretch of highway where we have to replace the gas mains and the water mains, and then the road, re road resurfacing needs to take place after those works have been carried out. It may well be the case that we will be asking TfL to change their um, planned. Uh, schedule of works. Um, that may also be true with the boroughs. So we think that um, the GLA is better placed in those circumstances to coordinate than TfL. Possibly, but I have to say another layer. It does sound rather like not invented by Mr Carr and the GLA, therefore let's have something else invented. There are already these steering groups and have been. Camden's got a good one, Westminster's got a good one, TfL worked with them. When, you're, when you've got a budget problem that you've got at the moment of a billion pounds, I know this is only 300k, but I would strongly suggest that you revisit this, but of course it's, it's ultimately your decision. I can remember Arnold? Yes, it's Chair, thank you. Um, I, I, I welcome this paper, um, and it goes back to a, a scrutiny, the last time we did a, a major scrutiny, and uh, one of the sessions we did was with local authorities about flooding and it affected at least 10 boroughs. And one of the awful things that came out of there was just a lack of coordination. Nobody was holding the lever of bringing these various bodies together. And you talked about um, Thames Water, who they themselves, um, in evidence to us, um, identified how there were gaps in the system, hours for delay in terms of who was doing what. So it, it's um, from an assembly point of view. Um, are you aware of the recommendations that came out of that scrutiny that we did? Because it did um, refer to the need of greater coordination. And if you are, then can you assure me that you have taken on, if not all the points, that, that those um, recommendations that we made, they will be part and parcel of one or in, in one or other of these job descriptions. Um, I will certainly revisit that assembly uh, report from what you have, as you have described it. And there have been many reports uh, looking into this issue. I, I would hope that we have um, uh, uh, adopted those uh, recommendations implicitly, but we'll try to make sure they're, they're explicit. Okay. I mean, can I go as far as to say, Jeff, I mean, if uh, Jeremy can send back a note to, uh, through you, because I just think, um, and I think it's what uh, my colleague is, is referring to, a 300k spend on um, a team, they've got to be able to deliver and deal with the issues, and I would really like them to be delivering with issues through our work, 
working in collaboration with our comrades um, from, or colleagues, some of them are comrades, some of them are colleagues, um, from boroughs and other of the uh, other major utilities that came to give evidence with us, because this is absolutely critical for Londoners. Senator Berry. Um, I have two questions. Um, in part 7.3 of the paper, um, it talks about the long-term funding of this. Um, obviously, to begin with, it's being funded through the London Lane Rental Scheme surplus. Um, and then it says there are several options for it to become self-financed in the future. Uh, voluntary contributions, um, user charging arrangements, or further surplus income from the lane rental. I and mean, one of the things I would assume is that if you can better coordinate these works, you'd get lower income from lane rentals. So that might be one of the things that you're trying to do. How confident are you that you'll get voluntary contributions? Because they're, they're quite rare. I would have yes. thought no one's going to pay anything they don't have to. Um, and so, yeah, how, does, how is that actually going to work? Shall I ask you my second question as well, just while I'm sure. doing it? Um, it's the job titles. They keep changing throughout the paper. Um, and I was interested to know um, from the organogram the two different senior analysts, one was Pan London and one was area focused, and what that might involve, are they going to focus on one particular area? But then I also noticed that the, the job title is different in the job description than it is in the organogram, so if you can sort of clarify what the job titles will be, that would be useful. So the and also um, what appendix is. 2 is, is, the, is the correct summary job descriptions, if there's a need to also you'll be, um, and apologies for the inconsistency, I'll, I'll have to check that. The issue about future income is that um, currently um, the position of the Lane Rental Funds Committee is that um, the funds shall be spent particularly on uh, innovative uh, activities and uh, our view was that this was very core to the achievement of the fund from its purpose, i.e. reducing streetworks uh, of congestion and the ad other adverse effects of streetworks. Um, so I think there is a case that if successful, uh, and we can demonstrate both savings to the public um, in terms of time savings and disruption, um, savings in terms of uh, reductions in, in pollution and improvements mm. in air quality, then uh, I think there would be a strong prima facie case to go back to the Lane Rental Fund and see that as a more long-term secure form of income as there is a very strong relationship potentially between this activity um, I think the other people who may potentially benefit are developers and there may be ways in which we can seek developer contributions although as we know developer contributions are also in some respects spoken for for other uh, mayoral priorities um, and then finally where you have um, say a large uh, uh, land assembly site with maybe two or three developers um, we have seen in the past voluntary contributions um, being made by those developers to activities which they would find uh, beneficial. So I think that's why we're being a little bit um, uh, imprecise at this point. Uh, it is a two-year pilot. It is possible that the overall benefits won't outweigh the input costs. Um, uh, I think it's more likely that it will be successful and that we'll both be able to persuade um, uh, uh, the existing funders that their funds will you know continue to be put to good purpose um, when we did the call over Pardon? when we did the the call over yes you, you'll know exactly the question I'm going to ask you now by yes. prefacing it in that way indeed um, I asked you how you'd be able to demonstrate the impact and, and you sure. you answered to some of them very just then you, you talked about uh, lower disruption better air quality etc etc um, how are you going to measure that in a way, say, smart objectives? How are you going to measure it in a way that we can recognise? So this is your starting point today. Um, you spent £600,000 between now and two years, and this is the outcome there. In a way that is actually meaningful. Because, I mean, for example, London and Partners uh, make an awful lot of dubious assertions around the impact of their work. You know, hundreds of millions of pounds of gross value added to London's economy, which are based on very little indeed, it seems to be as far as. How, I know this is going to be imprecise, but... Since I asked you that question at the call over and now, have you had a thought about how you're going to put something around that? Uh, yes. So in 4.6, we set out three areas where we believe that um, we will be able to make some measurements mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the reduction of congestion on London's roads, 
the cost of the street work provision mm -hmm. and the reduced cost of construction work. So what are the figures for each of those things now? Um, well, we so on the first example, we believe that, um, well, there's a study done across London in terms of the overall cost congestion in terms of um, cost to the public of approximately £750 million, pounds, but that's somewhat out of date. Now, we are not saying that this unit as a pilot with only five people is going to be able to make um, a systematic London-wide impact, but what we do believe is that at a micro level, case by case, area by area, street by street, we should be able to estimate by how much works uh, time is reduced and then translate that into a cost of time saving. Right, because when you run a pilot, you obviously want to have a demonstrable impact, so this is the result of this pilot. Mm -hmm. um, so if I were making a decision around funding this or not, mm -hmm. Uh, I would be looking at, okay, so you started off with whatever the level is of, of congestion on London's roads. As a direct result of the team that you've put in place, it has reduced by whatever figure it is. And that wouldn't have happened in any other way. So it can be solely attributed to the impact of your team. Are you able to do that on the measurements that you put in here? Well, we will be able to use the counterfactuals to say that if such and such an organisation were to carry out its works without working collaboratively, then the cost would be X, and that if they were to work collaboratively, the cost would be Y, and we would understand what the difference is. Now, the real question is whether they might have done that had we not bothered to intervene at all. Maybe they would have got together under their own um, auspices. Um, we believe that as a result, for instance, of bringing those passes already around the table in, a, in forums which we convene here at the GLA, we know that Thames Auto and SGN are talking and sharing information on um, uh, streets where they might collaborate. But more than that, um, these things don't just sort of happen um, because there's goodwill. There then has to be a huge amount of detailed work bringing the council, the uh, electricity providers, and then the digital um, um, uh, fibre providers and others, um, so that what seems like a good idea actually then translates into practice on the ground. And that can go through to things like alliance contracting, so that you have a single contractor on site. Um, and that actually involves a huge amount of uh, work and effort. And one of the reasons why we haven't seen this approach um, adopted universally in the past is that, uh, broadly speaking, it's not particularly in the individual utilities' interest to change their business models. As one leader of one firm put it to me uh, in a workshop, um, our model is to get in, get out as quickly as possible. Um, now, that may be in the interest of that company, but it may not be in the interests of the residents mm -hmm. if the street is just dug up. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose what I'm looking for is, is um, evidence um, at the end of the two-year pilot where you can demonstrate the difference between whether it's been successful or not, Yes. rather than an assumption or an estimate, actual, tangible evidence. Yes, so that's what, what we're proposing. Rather than um, the baseline being a study of all congestion in London today, which is, gives us an understanding of the scale of the problem and therefore the opportunity, we would rather build up um, area by area, street by street, the kind of micro level business case um, and aggregate those instead. Okay. Um, I think this might be a watch this space then. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other members? Nav uh, Sam on, on this issue, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you picked this up. I would like to have uh, some kind of reporting arrangements whereby you can. Uh, at, I don't know whether six monthly interval or whatever, you can let us know how in each of the categories where you indicated the progress that will be measured is actually given to us so that we know in what direction it's going and how stage by stage. Uh, how will you be monitoring it, Jeremy? Yeah. Um, how will you be what, what sort of time frames are you monitoring progress on this? Uh, well, we haven't set the team up yet, um, so yeah. it's a little bit premature, but yeah. um, I think the first, you know, as the paper says, one of the three key activities is indeed to measure and yeah. learn. Um, that itself uh, needs to be established. 
Mm. You know, um, we do have some statistics yeah. on the case study which I gave earlier. Uh, we do, we can measure time savings to the public, uh, reduced parking space, bay suspensions, and other uh, reduced costs for utilities. Based on your KPIs, if you can, you know, when you are at that stage, sure. can let the committee know how it is measuring so that we know the, yes. the, the direction of travel and then we, we are then able to monitor it as well as the... Well, we can either do that here or in the Budget Monitoring Subcommittee, which is what that committee exists to do. Yeah. So. Budget and monitoring an annual update. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, perhaps in the, in the wash up afterwards, we can sort of indicate what sort of review process we'll have on this so we can sort of see how it's progressing. Okay, um, if there's no other questions from members, we are recommended to respond. We've done that. Um, yeah. Can we agree to make the report? Yeah. Okay, uh, item eight is the um, Royal Docks <coughs> additional resourcing. Okay. Thank you very much, Chairman. <coughs> and with um, your permission, um, um, I'm going to say um, just a few remarks to um, set the scene and um, hand over to um, Dan Bridge, who is the Programme Director for the Royal Docks, who's going to do a short presentation just to set a bit of context for uh, the proposals that you've got this afternoon. Um, as I think colleagues um, will, will know, the um, Enterprise Zone um, uh, was announced by government in 2012 at the Royal Docks and um, became operational in 2013 with a 25-year commitment from government to recycle any additional business rates that were generated within the Royal Docks Enterprise Zone during that period. Um, following that, um, we um, set up a joint GLA uh, London Borough of Newham team. Uh, that was set up in August of, of um, 2017 um, and initially had uh, 10 staff, which Dan is responsible for. And their brief was to set about establishing the proper governance arrangements to do a thorough analysis of the projects and programmes uh, in the Royal Docks and come forward with a five-year um, funded delivery plan uh, with a financial strategy sitting behind that. Um, and the idea was that once that five-year delivery plan was presented and signed off by the relevant uh, institutions and individuals, um, we would then look at um, securing um, the executive and operational resources we need to deliver that plan and that's why these proposals are here with you today. So that process has been done. The Mayor, London Borough of Newham and the LEAP, the London LEAP have all signed off a £314 million delivery plan um, with an initial £212 million of that money um, approved in a budget, five year budget. Um, and I'm going to um, just highlight that the full costs of the staffing proposals in this paper are included within that budget and are covered within the GLA's base housing and land budget. So that's quite an important point to, to recognise. Um, and as I've mentioned, that budget, both for the costs associated with this proposed team and also for the projects and programmes that sit behind the team, um, are secured against the projected business rate growth, which Dan will explain in a minute or two. Um, and the scale, as we'll see in the presentation, I think the scale of both the challenges in the Royal Docks but also the opportunities um, are really very large indeed and quite complicated. Um, and so what we've done in assessing <coughs> the needs of the team as it grows and why we're recommending the 18 posts that are here this afternoon is because we've taken a very thorough uh, and full account of the detailed projects that are already underway and uh, are going to need um, attention, leadership and management, but also interrogated the various themes, programmes and future priorities that are set out in the five-year delivery plan. And um, the enhanced team, we believe, will have the capability and the resources to really drive that programme and deliver the business rate. Um, I do want to emphasise just three things as well uh, before I hand over to Dan. One is that um, the money that is being secured through the business rate growth, the um, £314 million delivery plan, is also leveraging and working alongside a great deal of additional investment. So as we speak, there's something like £2.5 billion of additional investment being leveraged into projects within the Royal Docks. And it's also worth noting, I think, that although we've not had the final sign-off, we um, are at a very advanced stage now with a housing infrastructure fund bid for the Royal Docks 
of another £138 million. And um, we can't be sure that that money will arrive, but I think we can be reasonably confident and optimistic about it. So this is a very, very large programme. That was the first thing. The second thing I want to emphasise is that the arrangements that exist down on the docks at the moment, um, I think has really broken new ground for us in terms of the collaboration and partnership between the GLA and the London Borough of Newham. It's a very successful joint team um, and it reports jointly to the GLA and to the London Borough of Newham as well as through to the London Leap. And we're very, very keen indeed to continue to support that very close collaborative working. And then the third and final point I'd like to make just before I hand over to Dan is that um, we are looking to recruit this team in quite an ambitious way. Um, we want to use the opportunity of 18 additional staff in the team in Newham to really look much more creatively at the way that we um, advertise posts, the way that we promote the opportunities and the way we think about recruiting in such a way as to give us the widest possible um, opportunity to attract talented people but also very importantly to really make it um, a relevant recruitment exercise for the local community as well as addressing you know head-on uh, the challenges that the GLA has um, to recruit a genuinely diverse and representative um, um, uh, staff profile. So I just wanted to finish with that point because we are working very closely with colleagues at TFL Recruitment. In fact, we had a very good workshop just last week to think about how to plan out this much more ambitious recruitment campaign. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to take you through a few slides just to illustrate you where we are with the Royal Docks and to illustrate um, in a bit more detail some of the points that David made. Um, so I think, you know, it's fair to say, and I'm going to emphasise the scale here, um, that this probably is one of the um, most exciting parts of London, not only in terms of the scale of the opportunity for development, both uh, resi and commercial, but also in terms of the pace of development um, and what's happening there. So there's, there's three lines on that that have been you know, born to know. Big, big uh, opportunity area planning framework, which includes large projects led by Newham. Um, this is the largest contiguous area of mayoral land within the mayor's land portfolio. Um, so that means we have control over those developments through development agreements, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. Um, and then importantly, as David said, we are managing and controlling the enterprise zone that gives us a very significant long-term income stream. So this, this is the only place in London where we've got genuine fiscal devolution, which is talked about a lot. Um, so it's really important that we make good work here. Um, so there are three key development sites within the enterprise zones. The first one is known as Royal Albert Dock. This is the largest outbound Chinese investment after the Hinkley Power Station. So uh, we have a Chinese development partner here that have completely speculatively funded the first phase of this development, which is about £300 million. Um, altogether, the size of this development is about one and a half times the size of more London where we sit today. Um, and the developer is um, finishing phase one of this development in spring of next year. So there's 600,000 square feet, very significant phase one that is on site and will be delivered next year. Second site, which is the largest site within the Enterprise Zone, is Silvertown Keys. This site is about the size of uh, King's Cross, the King's Cross project. Um, very significant site. We have planning consent for this site for just over 3,000 homes and about 4.5 million square feet of commercial space. So again, very, very significant mixed-use development. Um, we are working with a new development partner and funder that have come on board of this in the last, uh, in the, in the last few months. And we're working with them on the detailed planning to uh, do submit detailed planning next year and, um, and start delivery in 2020. Um, really importantly with this, we're working very closely with Roxana and, and the Mayor's housing team to really increase the amount of affordable housing that's already existing within this consent. And we're very confident that we'll be able to achieve that. Um, the third site in the Enterprise Zone is at the eastern end of the docks. It's called um, Albert Island. This is a really important project, um, not only for the Enterprise Zone, but for the most transport strategy, because we've got a development partner here to build a commercial boatyard as part of the development on this site, which will serve um, serve you know, the River Thames and the most transport strategy for the Thames. Um, we're also developing something called the Institute of Technology. There's a bid in to, to develop a new Institute of Technology on this site. Um, we're working with London and Region as a development partner on this site. They'll be submitting planning next year and we will also be starting on site in 2020. Um, so three very big sites on their own, but in and, in and around that we've also got about half a dozen residential-led sites, which again on their own are, are, are pretty significant. So we currently have about 2,000 homes on site under construction um, and, um, and a pipeline of residential development probably in the region of about 10,000 homes. 
Um, so, so again, quite a lot, lot underway. The, I mean, the thing is with this project is it is a very much a library generation project. It is happening. There's lots already being built, and there is lots under construction. So it, it's happening. Um, so as David said, um, what was really fundamental first key part for the thing for the team to do was to actually develop a, a full evidence base and a very, very detailed analysis of what it was that we needed to do over the next five years in support of all the really good work that we were doing managing the developments to make this to make this place work and primarily to make this a place where businesses are going to occupy. Um, to be quite frank, we are competing with the likes of King's Cross, Paddington, Moor London. Um, this is a fringe employment location at the moment and we've got a real big hump to get over to make this a place that is a place of choice for people to do business. Um, so we worked with my team, with Newham, um, with a, a selected team of consultants to develop a, a detailed delivery plan. Um, and uh, really importantly, this developed about 21 projects and initiatives. Um, and part of that was doing something what was called project initiation documents to understand exactly what the cost and resourcing was to deliver these projects. So, so the, the posts that we have here today have done been, been brought forward on a very detailed analysis of what, what it is is needed to deliver the projects in this plan. Um, uh, the plan effectively identifies a spatial framework, so those of you who've been to the Docks Gareth, I think that was a quite a long time ago now, I'm to you down, it's been worrying to think how long ago it was. But the, the really important thing is, what do we need to do in the next five years? This is probably at least a 15 year, year regeneration project, and those of you who've been to the Docks know that at the moment it doesn't work as a place. So we need to get some places working very well in the next five years. So there's a spatial framework about those key sites and, uh, and gateways and corridors to make this place work. Um, and then there's five strategic objectives and there's a number of projects around things that anyone would expect a place to make work <coughs> and they are set out here. Um, and that very much throws through into the structure of the team that you can see here. So the, uh, I think that there's a team structure here that I won't go through all the posts individually and you can might have comments on, but I guess a couple of things just to note. So as David said, it's really important that we're delivering this project collaboratively with Newham. It's the first bit of Docklands regeneration where I think there's been a genuine collaborative mm. approach between regional government and local government to deliver. Um, and so part of the consultation on, on this um, prior to it coming to you is to make sure that the economic development part of the programme and the community engagement part of the programme are very much delivered in conjunction with the local authority in line with Roxana Fias, the new mayor of Newham, her approach to uh, these sorts of areas. Um, you will also see that there's some GLAP funded posts that I have responsibility for and they're GLAP funded because they're looking after the development and we're also working with the head of economic development from Newham to, to oversee the, the work from the, um, uh, on the economic development piece. Um, and I think um, you, you can see how that team is structured. The new posts are in, new posts are in red and green. Um, just a, a graph to illustrate what we've managed to achieve in terms of getting GLA support, my, mayoral support and uh, the GLA finances team support. This is all predicated on this project being successful. So all of those files that you see on the left is the significant investment that we'll make over the next five years. The income comes down later down the line. So, um, you know, it was quite a big, I think it was quite a big leap of faith based upon lots of evidence. But, you know, for the Mayor of Newham to, to really, you know, have trust in our ability to deliver this. Um, and I think uh, also um, we're talking about an initial approval of 212 million. We need to go back to prove how we're doing uh, with the next, the, the detail for the next 100 million. And that's very much a part of some of the outcomes of the posts that you see here today. Um, and then just on terms of the income, so if we're very successful, there's a huge opportunity here if you forget all the socio-economic regeneration benefits, if you just look at this purely commercially, there's a huge opportunity here to deliver a significant amount of income from this enterprise, so up to in excess of £900 million if we're successful. Um, I genuinely believe that the work that we've done, it's absolutely imperative that we deliver this delivery plan and the things that are in it over the next five years to get any chance of getting anywhere near any of those higher figures in the delivery plan. You'll be pleased to know that um, for us to do, secure the funding for the, for, the, um, for the delivery plan, we only need to make the mid-scenario ones, but we should absolutely be targeting those high-level ones. And I think the other thing to say is we're looking at this uh, quite, quite carefully, and there are, as David mentioned, HIF, there are a number of other funding streams that we're looking at to support this and to reduce the borrowing requirement for the GLA, and we will continue to do that over time. Um, and one of the important components of this is developer contributions are planned over a period of time from all of the developers. 
what we're doing is we're forward funding a lot of this work and then taking that contribution back to them from them over time so that we're actually creating a platform and, 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 and the quality of the place earlier than the developers are required to do it through the development agreements and section 106s. So that was a very quick canter through quite a lot. Um, I don't intend to go through the detail of the paper, but I'm very happy to answer any comments that any of you have on uh, any, any of the things that we've talked about or anything that's in the paper. Okay, unsurprisingly, this is attracting members' attention, um, but uh, selfishly, I'm going to exert the Chairman's prompt here and ask the first question, um, which is it's got, it's about, I, I think everyone gets the, the scale and importance of the development. I don't think anyone's mm. problem with that. Um, the main item for the committee really is about the recruitment though, mm. and the additional posts. Um, again, David, you've had a slight heads up about where I'm going to go with this. Uh, 18 posts is a large chunk of recruitment at the same time. Is it going to be done at the same time or are you phasing it? Well, um, I'm going to let Dan come in on that, but um, we are, I think, certainly looking to try and advertise um, the scale of the opportunity locally um, to give people a chance to see what we are planning to do here and how many posts will be available. There will inevitably be a need for some sequencing in terms of you know, who gets recruited first, um, partly <coughs> just in terms of logistics and planning, and partly because this may not always be possible, but it would be quite nice if certainly some senior posts could potentially have some influence over some of the recruitment in their teams. That's going to be um, uh, a challenge that we're going to explore in um, a follow-up workshop, workshop with TfL colleagues in a week or two's time that we're organising um, with HR colleagues here. Um, but I think there's a kind of balance to be struck here between the pace at which we want to recruit in order to not see the, the, the opportunities slip and just the sheer disruption um, that can um, sometimes happen if you're taking on a major recruitment exercise in a short space of time. But Dan, do you want to add to that? I think the only thing I would add is that this is a multidisciplinary team and we already have the, the majority of the, the head of within post, so that it's very much going to be a delegated approach. You have the majority of what in post? The head, so the heads of each of those teams or the leaders of each of those teams four out of the five of them are already in, in post. Okay. So they will very much lead on the recruitment of their mini teams. Right. Um, the other thing I would say, David mentioned, we are using TFL recruitment and they are um, actually, you know, very, they're very, very good. And they're used to doing very high volume recruitments um, in a very sophisticated way. Um, and so they are, um, the, the team that we're working with, we've got a dedicated recruitment resource that's based in my team part of the week. Um, she's working with the team and to develop a very sophisticated campaign. In, in reality, there will be a slight staging to the recruitment yeah. because, um, because of people's time um, and because of all of the things that we're doing, particularly around diversity and inclusion, to make sure we have balanced panels, make sure people have been um, trained from unconscious bias. We're doing some, um, we, it's very important for us that very locally we, we manage to try and target local recruitment and so we'll be doing job fairs and things. So we're working on a what I hope is a very exemplary campaign that um, you know, it's very important to you in particular but also to us. So I am pretty confident with the support that we're getting from Charmaine's team and from, um, and, and from the, the, the TFL team that we can manage this in a way. But I do want to try and push to get this recruitment done relatively quickly in the new year because it's, there's lots for us to do. Okay, you want to push the button in the new year, um, fine. Um, time scales until completion. Time scales for what? And, and to, until completion. Of the recruitment? recruitment. Yeah. Um, so, um, so by that I mean start date, because obviously people will be on notice periods and that sort of thing. Absolutely. So we are pro we're, we're, we're targeting the moment to start date of about the end of January, and I'm hoping by the end of the no, summer. Start by the end. Right. So, so, yeah, I so mean, the, the campaign. The campaign. Yeah. Uh, the work's already started. So there's a yeah. huge amount of work to do to develop the campaign. Yeah. And fortunately, we've we've done quite a lot of work around branding, team identity, and all the things yeah, that yeah. would lead to a campaign. Campaign, job descriptions, all that stuff's done. Yeah. The campaign will go live early February. Um, and then we are hoping by the end of the summer, so August, September time, I am hopeful that the vast majority of those posts will be in position. Right. Um, it's, you know, it, there's, a, there's a, a lot to do and actually the programme will slip if we don't manage to secure those posts. Okay. The cost that you've attached to it, the £1.14 million, pounds, yeah. that's a full year cost or a part year cost? Full year cost. Okay, because um, it's not going to be a full year cost, is it? If, if you're going to get people in post by, say, September, it's going to be a half year cost in the next financial year. But. Yeah. 
there absolutely are. and um, we are so we've we are and actually we have to go because this is a leap funded project we have to go to the leap board at the end of um actually next week that's the final approval for this yep. um and there's a detailed proposal in there for the funding across the whole of the five-year program that takes into account the gaps that we're currently having and i think um, cumulatively for the whole team it's around about eight million pounds which equates to about two percent of the program overall. okay um, right, I've monopolised you a little bit. I've, I've got so far, in order that I've seen them, Assembly Members Berry, Copley, Arnold and Devonish. Assembly Member Berry. OK, um, I have two sort of related questions. I think you just sort of admitted that the, the fact that it's mainly commercial development is, isn't dictated by its location. It's not in the ideal location for that. And actually, the fact that it's mainly commercial is, is largely led by the fact that there's, there's an airport in the middle of it and therefore you can't build as much housing as you would like. So my question is about the Housing Infrastructure Fund, which, which I, I think David said a different number than what is on your slide in terms of the assumptions of what you might get from the Housing Infrastructure Fund. I don't know if some of it might be in the future, um, but there's 67.7 million on the slide that, about sources of income. And I think David, you said 138 million was the bid that you put in. So my question is also to clarify that number, but also because the slide says it's the Housing and Infrastructure Fund, but it isn't. It's the Housing Infrastructure Fund. And so the fund is, is focused on delivering housing. And with a, are you that confident that you're going to get that money for a development that's quite so focused on commercial property because of its location, is my question, really. How certain is that income? And then my second question is very simple, which is, are any of the, the, the placemaking and um, sort of transport-based people going to be working on... Um, Things to do with the Silvertown Tunnel, which lands in the area. Yeah, so, so I, th I think a couple of things. So I think you know, right back from the 1980s when the docks closed, locally and within Newham and elsewhere, it's been really, really important that this area reprovides jobs for the people that live in that part of London. So that's been at the heart of everything that's tried to be achieved. So I take your point. There's, there's certain elements of the site where. Um, because of the proximity to the airport that they need to be commercial but actually we've developed very very successful residential development very very close to the airport and i talked a lot about commercial because this is enterprise zone funding um, but you know on gla owned land i think we're talking in, you know, in the region of um, about you know, 10 to twelve thousand homes and then it's in the wider area the wider opportunity area we're talking about twenty five thousand homes yeah i mean i mean just on that i mean just just to be quite topical about it there's there's a major planning application likely to be lodged with Newham in the next week for the Thameside West development, which sits to the south of the Enterprise Zone, just outside the boundary. Uh, but clearly, that's going to have that's going to be majorly impacted from these investments. So that goes to part of the answer, I think, around the HIF. The HIF is not just generating housing outputs within the tight red zone of the um, of the Enterprise Zone, but it's also these adjacent sites um, such as Thameside West and others. So you're still you're, you're confident that you'll get that. And, what, and how much are you applying for? Because the like I said, the two numbers are slightly different. So there's a there's a so there's an overlap. So there's the stuff that we're talking about today is about enterprise zone. So it's about generating business right income that pays it back. Some of the some of the things that we've talked about there, the sixty million pound figure that you mm -hmm. talked about, can be attributed to both housing and commercial development. So it does both. The, the higher figure, which is the total figure of the of the HIF bid, the 138 million, is paying for infrastructure to support residential development outside of the enterprise out. So, so I'm still on the boundary. Sorry. So the uh -huh. so the so total bid is exactly. goes so out. The total bid. Yeah. So the total bid. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So the total bid covers an area wider than the enterprise zone. So the 63 is the bid that is that is. Features yeah, so the HIF bid is so focused on housing and then that makes you more confident that you'll get it. Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. That makes more sense. Yeah. Out on Silvertown? Oh, sorry, Silvertown Tunnel. No, none of the posts. Well, none of the posts here at, um, will be directly involved in the delivery of the Silvertown Tunnel. They're um, not not mentioned here, but we are um, through an agreement with TFL. We're funding a post within TFL, um, which is a liaison post um, to manage the delivery of or manage the delivery of um, the, the station upgrades, and there'll be a liaison role for that person. When you say we, that would be. The enterprise, who's, who's, the enterprise zone is so funding a, project, a so there's a project within here that yeah. is that is funding TFL to deliver upgrades to DLR stations as part of that funding agreement that covers the resource within TFL that's required to deliver those projects. Could I just also just pick up very quickly on the um, on on the, the point you made about this is not currently a sort of prime commercial 
sort of office. Well, you said that. I, I mean, I was just saying that it's commercial for a reason. That yeah, it's not I was just, just going to say commercial. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you are right. There are definite site constraints here because mm. of the airport, and the airport also offers fantastic benefits in terms of location for business. But I think it's also important to register the fact that. Well, number one, um, both the GLA and particularly London Borough and Newham are extremely keen um, to see economic development and employment opportunities here. Um, and secondly, um, obviously, in order to generate these additional business rates, uh, we need new businesses. So housing doesn't generate the business rate we need. And, and the third thing, I think, and maybe the most important of all, is that you know, on a scale that we're talking about, if we don't have a genuine mix of employment and commercial, leisure, culture with residential, um, then it's really not going to feel like a very exciting or livable place. So I, I, I think we're very much on track to delivering this as, if you like, London's new up and coming business district with the investment that's going on. But if we fail in that, it won't just be the money that doesn't come in, it will be the whole sense of place and sustainability that won't work. Okay, Assembly Member Coffey. Yeah, Chair, my question's completely gone out of my head, so if it comes back, <laughs> if it comes back I'll let you know. But Outstanding contribution, if I may say so. Pros of eat calm question. <laughs> Same member on. Yeah. Chair, I have got some questions, because um, I go back to what Daniel said. As somebody who's been involved with regeneration and whatever the term is around London, this site has had its um, you know, expectations about it, so it's really great to be at this meeting to hear what's going on. And I recently met up with Mayor uh, Roxana Fias, and uh, I can't, uh, well, I can say that the sort of um, uh, confidence that her election and her post uh, gives to this um, is immense uh, because she's on record as saying, like, she is going to be standing there to ensure that um, it is a place fit for the people she represents and the employment issues are as important to her as anything else that, that happens here and uh, I, I, I am supportive of her and wish her well because that's an ambition that we should have for any place and can I also say to Daniel I sat on the King's Cross partnership for about eight years from its implementation to Lisa and King's Cross was not the desired place that it is today um, a department of whatever, uh, when we went to the department seeking the funding, said uh, the area was like the armpits on a body. Um, to, uh, we, we, uh, people know that the armpit's there, but it's never discussed in public. Um, you know, so, so, you know, that was... Until now. Until yeah. now. <laughs> and, and so I love it that, you know, like King's Cross, so trendy. And uh, I don't know what was said about Paddington, but I'm sure mm -hmm. what, whichever bit on the body of that you could make the analogy about. Um, so uh, I, I think it's our, all our duties to talk about, you know, the Newham and the opportunities there. And it is, it is just a zone away or two zones away. I think it's... There's an opportunity. I don't think it's a negative thing that it's got an airport, that it's got universities around it. I think it's the most exciting place in London. And also, we forget that's where London is. London belongs, uh, London is of the East, and all that's happening now is the repositioning of London um, and, and where people are. Now, I, I'm pleased at all that I've heard, but you will forgive me if I say I've sat around tables long enough to have heard all the promises about diversity as that one could hear. And I also say, I'm not always convinced when I hear TfL, because when I look at what its achievement, it's taken quite a long time for it to actually get its act together. So I really want the assurance that um, Newham, um, with the mayor's leadership and commitment, will be part and parcel of driving this um, need for there to be the diversity and um, the inclusion of um, the population. And I'm not talking about getting to jobs fair, about construction and stuff. I'm talking from the start that you can give an account that there has been an attempt to get diversity, to get local people engaged in all the job. Let me just finish by saying, Newham as a borough has one of the highest rates of, um, uh, what do you call it, degrees and professional people. So 
I, I will never accept that it's not, um, it's not uh, that there's no talent in the area. Mm -hmm. It's about how do organisations like these organisations and the recruitment re relate and get that message out. So it, the one question was how closely you're working with the Mayor of Newham, who I am totally committed to her and know her well enough to, to feel assured by what she said. So, um, so you'll be pleased to know we're working incredibly closely with Roxana and actually since she was elected she's taken up the, the chair of um, the EZ Programme Board and the co-chair of the Royal Docs Advisory Board with James Murray which are the two bodies that oversee the, 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 this programme of activity and um, we've had lots of conversations with Roxana about how making sure that every part of this programme from, you know, from DLR station upgrades through to recruitment and community arts programmes that we're genuinely thinking about how we're developing those programmes so so that people that live in what is known as urban Newham really feel as though that what we're doing there is is for them and is, is you know is incredibly inclusive in every way um, and we're having lots of active discussions about that at the moment and Gareth was talking in one of the previous items about impact evaluation and measurement um, so that's one of the other things that we're doing a lot a lot with at the moment is to understand exactly how we're baselining and measuring that impact so that um, so that you know hopefully we can come back here in a couple of years time and really demonstrate how we've managed to achieve that through the range of projects and programs that are in this delivery plan um, and in, in relation to the recruitment in particular there's two posts in here um, which is a two two community engagement post so Roxana is um, clearly introducing a new citizens um, a new approach to citizen assemblies and community empowerment um, and one of the things in the consultation with Newham was that very much that we didn't want to set up our own team separate from what Newham was doing. It's really important that they maintain and manage those the relationship with their communities. Um, and so the two posts that are here will be dedicated people to make sure that our programme does what you were talking about achieving. Um, and they will be delivered, they'll be co-managed by, um, <coughs> by Newham and the Newham communities team and the new structure that Roxana is delivering. Yes, well thank you for that because that was one of the questions <coughs> that I had because undoubtedly when we saw success coming out of the big build on the, um, on the Olympic side, yeah. um, the buy-in, yeah. as, as good as it got, yeah. wasn't perfect, was because of excellent community engagement yes. located within yeah. the borough. So yeah. I'm glad to hear that. And then the only concerns I have, and, and I, I, I think um, you more needs to be said about this, is um, to get a sense of place, you have to start with good design. Yeah. Um, and you have to really not be scrimping on it. And I think that's one of the things that sells King's Cross yeah. and Paddington and other major areas um, yeah. versus other places. Yeah. And I just want an assurance that um, in terms of the needs, I mean, if Nikki, who is the doyen of all this, was here, she'd be saying the same. Um, can you assure us you're not going to scrimp on the need for decent design to actually create that sense of place yeah. within environmental structures. Um, so, so one of the one of the well, actually the most significant project as part of this delivery plan is something which we call place strategies, public mm -hmm. realm strategy. So we pushed our development partners within their red line boundaries to do mm -hmm. very very good design. As does you, and we're through their design mm -hmm. associate panel. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the significant projects that we've got is this play strategy, which is about the public realm and the water and, the, and the in and around the docks to connect all of these developments together through very, very high quality mm -hmm. public realm. Um, mm -hmm. And we're talking to, um, to Debbie and her team about how we engage in, and obviously with the mayoral design advisors and the new design review panel on that. Um, but what we're finding with our development partners as the place establishes the quality of the architects and the teams that we're working with. David mentioned um, the scheme, Thameside West, that we're submitting for planning hopefully within the next couple of weeks. That's got Fosters and Partners developing uh, developing that master plan with McCaslin. Um, and so there's been a real, I think it's fair to say there's been a real step change actually in the quality of the development that's come through as the place is starting to yeah. establish. Um, similarly with the work that we're doing on Silvertown Keys, there's a, a charrette underway as we speak with um, some of the best architects in the world to think about how we repurpose Millennium Mills, um, working, Lemon used to work in with us on that so there's a real you know it, there's a real desire I, you know, I don't think we've, we've achieved that anywhere else in London yet within Dockland regeneration for us to do something very very special here um, and I can assure you that all parts of the team will be pushing very very hard so that we can you know we've got a poster child for good growth in good design but good good socio-economic growth as well thank you 
Um, Assemblyman Berry, your ears appeared to prick up when we decided, when Assemblyman Arnold was asking about good design. Is it on that subject? Because if not, it's, I'm going to ask you after. It's just a very quick note on, on the King's Cross issue, because obviously, I mean, you'll, you'll tell me you've been working on it since before I was born, but I've been working on it since... Just a fact. It probably <laughs> should, but Which I'm, I'm proud of. I know. Because um, I I'm, know how old I'll be. You're not sure yet. <laughs> I have been working on it since the first draft master plan, so that's not quite as long. Um, but... Um, I think I think in, I didn't express opinion about this before, but but I wanted to just sort of chip in. Um, I think in King, in Camden we slightly regret the fact that the southern part of the, the development in King's Cross is almost entirely commercial; that it isn't more mixed. Um, and I realise that you have this physical constraint of the of the, um, the airport, sort of dictating that you have that same sort of pattern. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to sort of put that in that, that it is perhaps a little bit too barren and, and devoid of life at the bottom end of King's Cross now and I think we would probably do it differently if we were to do it again and this is some of the things that the local community were arguing for right at the start of the, the master planning process there was to put more housing in into the south. Um, so hopefully I, I'm really reassured to hear that the, the Mayor of Newham is going to be chairing the board actually because that does mean that probably there will be more and better community consultation as a result and it won't all be design led because I think that, can, that again is one of the issues perhaps with King's Cross that it isn't it's beautiful um, but it perhaps isn't as much of a community as it, as it could have been yeah no, I just think that's <laughs> sorry I hope that's right chair uh, quite <laughs> right uh, it's an interesting anecdote to put on the table mm. um, right I've seen Assemblymember um, Devonish and then we'll come back to Assemblymember Sharp can I ask a question? You're trying to recruit 18 permanent posts and spend 1.1 million of taxpayers' money, and you've both inferred very strongly without saying it that it's Newham jobs for Newham people. Now, I don't have any problem with that per se, apart from one, can you legally do that? And two, if you're with Mayor Roxana and she said to you, there's 18 posts, I want 18 of them to be Newham, clearly that's almost illegal. So are you going to give me a number of how many of those posts are at least going to come from East London rather than much of the development industry that all live in Hertfordshire. So that's my first question. Uh, and my second question is, as most of these posts appear to my eyesight to be what I would always call comms and community engagement posts, why can't you get your private sector partners to do their job and employ these people and save us 1.1 million of taxpayers' money? Thank you. Okay. That's, that's fine, yeah. So I think, I think the first two, so we're having conversations with, uh, with this TFL recruitment team that we're talking at the moment about what's appropriate in terms of either using targets for, local in, for local recruitment and diversity and inclusion. I think we're probably moving away from that to making sure that we have the best possible campaign to get the best possible candidates from the areas that we're very interested in. Um, I think, I think Newham, through their Section 106 agreements, absolutely put some obligations on development partners to recruit people from, from Newham, and I think in some cases that's successful. Um, but we are, you know, we're very, very keen to do that. Um, the, the second point that you raise, which is about why, aren't, why don't we get the development partners to do it, so, um, you know, I think that's a, that's a fair comment, um, and they are doing a huge amount of work themselves. The issue that we have in the Royal Docks um, is that we are probably working with about 10 different development partners and then probably a similar number of very significant stakeholders who are all either investing or operating very large businesses within a patch like um, Excel. And actually, the reason that we've put forward the proposal today is very much in response to the requests and demands from them to coordinate the activity that they are doing to really amplify and create a, co a coherence and, a, a, and a around the narrative there. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's absolutely something that, that the private sector and our development partners have requested. And we are, we are working with them to add value to what they do. This isn't about replacing what they do, it's about, it's about coordinating, enabling and adding value to, to the, the work and the money that they're already spending. Okay, so you basically told me at the moment you haven't got any targets for how many of these people will come from, but you will come back with targets. Can you tell the committee a date when you can come back with targets and how you're going to measure that? And in terms of the basically rolling out the match funding, if you've got 10 private sector partners, surely you can go back to them. David's brilliant at this kind of thing. And uh, advise them to put their hand in their pocketbook rather than spend 1.1 million more of taxpayers' money. I'm not really convinced of your second answer. Can I just maybe just, to, just, just respond to both those points briefly? I think in terms of local jobs for local people, um, as Dan says, yes, they, they, Newham obviously have their own arrangements through Section 106. 
In terms of this, I think the most important thing, to be, to be candid, is to get the very best opportunities um, out there for local people to compete for. And we will certainly be interested in things like how much passion, commitment, local knowledge, etc. people will have here. But I'd be slightly reluctant to commit to a target number for people living within a specific postcode, certainly before talking to you know, Newham who will also have views about this. So I think there's a, a note of caution here. This is about a much more radical and ambitious approach. Now, I just asked for a date, David, when you could come back. I didn't ask you to give us okay. the answer now. I Fair enough. When you could come back to the well, committee I, would be, with I, that. I think I'd be extremely happy to come back to the committee and report back on the lessons learned and hopefully the success of the recruitment exercise, because this is breaking new ground for uh, the GLA. Uh, and also, you know, very happy to report back on who we've appointed. Um, and uh, as far as we can, where they come from as well. Well, I'd, I'd sort of noted in my brief here that maybe we should bring you back in around about September in next year's committee work programme. I won't be chairing it at that time, but we might. And there will be an open there. invitation for the committee to meet in the Royal Docks. If yeah, it would be, be great. Yeah, it's probably time to refresh my memory, so I think we'll probably do that. Uh, I think it was probably about four years ago we went down. Um, Chair, on this point. Yes, Assemblymember Prince. Thank you. Um, I'm always concerned, actually, when it, and you, uh, Assembly Member Devon Schrader's good point, I'm always concerned when there's lots of public money flooding into Newham that they always try to hoover up all the jobs and we saw it with the Olympics we've seen it with uh, City Airport and I think it's about time someone actually said to Newham you know this is public money and those jobs should be shared yes of course there are challenges in Newham but there's also challenges in neighbouring boroughs such as B&D, Redbridge, Havering not so much, uh, Tower Hamlets and I think the agreement should be yes to employ local people, but to define that local area is far wider than just the boundaries of Newham. And I'd be very disappointed if there was a, a massive number of people employed using public money just who live in Newham. I think the, the whole region should benefit, not just Newham. Would you like to think that Sean accepts? I mean, it's absolutely really important that we do provide opportunities for local people, but um, this is a project. A city, this that. is a city scale project. It's actually an international scale project with a whole range of international development partners. Um, so I think um, you know it's a it's about it's a fine balance about providing locally and creating a place that works locally for the existing community. But this is a this is a city wide regeneration opportunity, and the businesses that come in there and the people that they will need to attract will be at least city wide. They'll probably be in, you know it's an international project, an international scale project. Um, but I think it's I think it's I think it's important that we do provide opportunity some opportunity for for local people. Yes, but I think the point is how you def sorry. Yeah, it's how you define local, and I would say it should be for the East End. East London, yeah. For East Londoners. Yeah. Well, you may say that, but it's new on property it's sitting in. But it's, it's uh, London, I'm not good London money, money being invested. It's not just money. It's like we had it with the Olympics. We, had it, we have it with City Airport. We, you know, it's not just uh, new and money being invested. If, it was a, if New and were just doing all the investment, I'd agree with you, but it's not. It's money from Londoners being invested. And the country. Okay, I, I think the point's made. I, 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 I think we're in danger of um, dancing on the head of a pin, uh, which is something I heard earlier today. Um, Senator Member Sharp. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> we, we have, uh, in a way, two very important, very significant sites across London when it comes to huge stake for London and Londoners. One is OPDC, another is Royal Docks. Both quite different when we look at uh, their context and content, etc. So I very much welcome this whole process where we are now having a, a team to, get the, to look at the delivery plan. And I, I, I accept uh, uh, the, the sort of comments made about uh, uh, both the, the, the sort of high level design and uh, the ambitious plans that, that are required for uh, the great environment that will be expected uh, uh, that, that are created for both current and uh, the future uh, uh, residents and stakeholders in the area. So I, I, I do very much uh, welcome the, this huge uh, opportunities that we have in the team in principle. Uh, in terms of questions, will the team have uh, the expertise that is required for some of those significantly different uh, kind of land uses that we have 
of, I mean, obviously we got 3,000 homes plus uh, uh, commercial, and indeed we're talking about millennium mills, for example, and cultural and creative industries, yeah. Uh, what will be the long-term status of this team? Will this team sort of act as this sort of firm foundation to, for, for uh, the whole of uh, Royal Docks development, which will then build on it and obviously change a, as required? Or, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'd like to, to know clearly what is the kind of uh, emphasis on these teams. It, it, this is obviously delivery sort of planned over five-year period, as it says. Okay, can you tell us a bit more in detail about the team that... Yeah, so we, we, we've worked team. very hard to keep the, the core team that you see today, the core multidisciplinary team, as tight as tight as we possibly can to, to be able to deliver the programme, but to do that in that most efficient way possible. Um, it's a multidisciplinary team, so I think yeah. it absolutely should have the skills to do all of the things that are incredibly important to create a, a place, a successful place. And in terms of the long-term strategy, so the, the really good thing about this approach with the fiscal devolution is everything that we're doing here, we're thinking about an investment to generate business rate return for the, for the long term. And, and that's a combination of thinking about how successful we are now will, I think, depend upon how long the team will survive. Um, um, and also we're looking at a number of other opportunities through this delivery programme to look at other ways that we could generate revenue into the long term, whether that's through hiring out space in public realm for events or thinking about investments in workspace and stuff. So there's other sources of long term revenue that means that we can sustain and manage this place for the long term. Um, but all of, the, all of the ingredients are there for us to be able to do that. Um, this is a this is seeking approval for the, the five year funding through uh, through the leap is for is for five years. Um, the core team is supportable beyond that five years just from the business rate income, um, but we'll be very much reviewing that at the end of this five year delivery plan to say you know, is the team still required? Um, some of the capital works might be done. Some other things might need to happen, um, but it's really thinking about and this is an investment to generate long term revenue from business rates and other sources to give us options to do that beyond five years. Well, what is the long-term approach in terms of sustaining a GLA team, whatever the funding sources are, to make sure that uh, we have a team, in-house team, which does monitor both the vision, the scale and quality of development that we have, yeah. rather than rely directly on developers yeah. having their own teams yeah. and telling us oh, everything is marvelous. Yeah. So the, yeah. so, the, so the GLAP posts, the ones we talked about, they're yeah. the ones that are responsible for the management of the development agreements with development partners, and clearly they'll continue to be funded through GLAP. One of the things that we set on the delivery plan is changing the, the, the mindset of how we've thought about the World Docs into thinking about it as a great sure. state. So it's about saying what is the long-term view for this place. It is going to need to be managed because of the nature of the state into the long term. What this delivery plan, I think, does, it allows us to develop within this five-year period a sustainable future for this whole of this estate and to make recommendations um, you know, as we get towards the end of this delivery plan around, about, around what a what are the options for the sustainable future of this place because it has the opportunity i think to provide a, a, a new quarter for london that you know may host quite significant large-scale events it's got an amazing body of water that we may be able to do interesting things with um, and, and that's very much been embedded in our approach to this delivery plan and, and to think about how we're managing these investments there's a reference to 3200 homes in one of your slides yes is that uh, just the silver town, or is it silver town in other parts? 3,200 is what the, the current planning consent, outline planning consent is for silver town. Silver town, yeah. Okay. How much is affordable? What's the ambition? For um, so, as I, as I mentioned, the um, the the ambition with the with the new mayor of London and the mayor new mayor of Newham is to significantly increase the um, increase the affordable housing level on that site with a, an aspiration to achieve 50 percent. Um, the current planning consent is uh, targeted 35% because it was procured under the previous administration. Yeah. Um, but we're, we're, we're sub subject to negotiation and discussion with the planning authority and, and the developer, but we're reasonably confident that we will be able to significantly improve the affordable housing offer on that, on that scheme. Thank you. Okay. Members, we are uh, recommended to, again, to respond to the report. I think we've done that. Uh, are we happy to note the report? Yeah. Agreed. 
Thank you, members. We have one uh, paper still to be presented, which is item nine, which is the workforce report, and that's the Charmaine is going to be presenting that. Okay. Um, so this report sets out the, uh, the data for the first two quarters of this financial year, so 2018-19. Um, it draws uh, from a number of uh, external data sources for the benchmarks that are set out. And I'll just highlight, I think, for each section, uh, some of the key, uh, uh, key pieces of data that we are sharing. So work, uh, section four covers the workforce composition. And as, as in previous reports, we're reporting on the number of people that are in post, uh, which is um, at 953 as at the 30th of September. Um, representing a 5% increase. Uh, but also in this report, we are setting out the number of uh, full-time equivalent posts on, on the establishment. Uh, the data set is slightly different uh, at the 31st of October, but that's at 4.4 and is set out at 1140 full-time equivalent posts. Um, the difference, of course, is uh, um, uh, attributed to a number of vacancies that we're carrying as an organisation, um, as people are moving around, leaving, resi uh, resigning, um, and the recruitment that's, uh, that's coming in. Um, in terms of vacancies, uh, we have 141 vacancies that are currently being recruited to, and I think it's fair to say that um, the growth has put pressure on the recruitment team to deliver, and that in some way has also um, helped David, Luntz and I uh, look at the other options for recruitment, for example, um, sourcing how TfL will be, will be able to support us, particularly in some of the bulk recruitment that's to come. Um, we have a number of agency workers. They're not represented in the 953 uh, figure, just for clarity. Some of those are sitting in established posts, and in some circumstances, they're also sitting in posts which are funded by contingency funding if there's a very short-term um, acute need for a particular set of skills. We need to do more, some, some more data analysis on, analysis on the... Um, uh, where the agency staff are sitting in terms of the posts. Um, in previous reports, um, we've also set out uh, uh, workforce representation, so our diversity data, and I've taken questions on that uh, in the past. Um, at section 5.2, uh, we set out our BAME workforce analysis, and whilst we are recruitment is recruiting more BME staff than before, that's set out later in the report, um, and we have more staff. Um, who are declaring themselves as BME at um, uh, uh, 241, we still are not keeping pace with the overall growth of the organisation. So we need to close the gap between uh, the current workforce at 25% and the economically active population at 36%. I can talk a little bit more about the work that we're doing to do that. Um, however, gender uh, paints a different picture where we are now above 50% overall and at senior grades, and I think represents... Um, the sort of longer investment that we've had in terms of policies um, and procedures that support women remaining in the workplace. You know, 188% of those who are part-time are women, which shows, our, I, I think, our commitment uh, quite, quite uh, clearly. Um, around disability analysis, we know that we've more, more to do, uh, but in the last few weeks we have now... Uh, um, uh, have representation from staff to set up a disability network I call that out particularly because I think having a staff network around disability will really help us to understand the challenges that staff face uh, within the organisation, but also help us to attract better talent, both for people who have visible and invisible disabilities. Uh, moving on then, uh, we, uh, at Salaries, we had uh, implemented the annual pay award in a more timely way, uh, thank, uh, thanks to Unison and colleagues uh, for bringing forth their pay claim earlier than um, previous years, and that's um, increased the average salary slightly. Um, and at uh, paragraph 7.2, we uh, set out some additional payments and how those are represented, and we know already that we need to do some work on making that uh, more transparent and understanding uh, how additional payments are made, particularly if they're discretionary and for uh, good pieces of work. Um, we have uh, we will be reviewing the policy on those uh, going forward. Uh, sickness absence remains low. Um, I think a fair challenge would be, are we reporting it accurately? And I think there will be, uh, we will probably do some communications over the next period to make sure that that is the case, particularly as we enter the winter season and there's lots of uh, colds and flus. Um, and then lastly, ending uh, uh, with recruitment, 
uh, where we have uh, reported 198 um, uh, new appointments in the last six months. And I think some of the policies that we are now putting in place, there's much more work to be done, is showing some improvement, particularly in the numbers of um, percentage of BME external appointees we're, ma we're making externally, uh, and also uh, female appointees and those with uh, disabilities. Uh, I think there's lots more work to do in this area, particularly around working with some specialist agencies. And we've also got work underway, which I've set out in Annex 2, to um, gather insight uh, on the attraction strategies that we need to put in place. That's all the way from how can we attract more BME staff into the recruitment pools in the first place. And we've done intake gathering uh, with staff internally, and we'll look at the next phase, we'll be look at how, what we can do on our websites and our uh, policies to make that more inclusive. Um, learning and development is set out in the last two um, sections as our apprentices, but I will pause there. Thank you very much, Amin. And I've got a few questions myself, and I imagine other members will want to come in as well. I've already seen one. Um, you mentioned agency staff. This doesn't include numbers of agency staff. How many agency staff do we employ at the moment? Um, it does at paragraph 4.6. Sorry if I'm um, uh, said you. It's at September we have 78 um, yep. agency staff um, in post. Um, I think what I was trying to explain was some of those agency <laughs> staff um, will be covering established posts, so posts that are vacant, um, or where the need has been so um, urgent that whilst recruitment is underway, we've brought an agency staff uh, person in to, to cover the post. Um, some of those are in um, other posts which are not established, maybe funded for a, a short period of time from contingency funding for a particular need or a particular requirement. Um, we want to do more work on that to understand where the agency staff sit exactly and in which post, but uh, we weren't able to do it for this report. What's the average length of tenure of an agency employee? Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I can come back to the yeah. committee on that. Okay. Um, it will vary from, from what I can see, it varies from uh, post to post. Um, yeah. Where um, managers know that the, uh, for example, uh, Funding is uh, coming downstream, maybe um, from an external source, then that might be for a longer period of time. Because in some instances, it can be quite short to cover, for example, unexpected illness um, or a delay in recruitment. Okay. How much do we spend on agency recruitment per year? Um, I will have to come back to the committee on that. Um, what's the average associated cost per full time post? You mentioned the 953. The establishment figure, which is in here for the first time I think we've seen this, of 1,140. Mm -hmm. When you are, when there are uh, growth bids brought forward, what is the average cost per employee that is built into that assumption? I think, I, unless Martin will tell me, I think the um, average cost will really be based on the grade and the salaries of the, of the individual. So I, I think what from, from looking back past before I joined and looking forward, the growth bids vary in terms of um, the skill sets that are required and the, and the uh, grading of the, the grade mix of the stuff that we're bringing in. Chair, just to add, we do all have estimating our budgeting, <coughs> excuse me, at the midpoint of the grade. Okay, <coughs> so there isn't a fixed cost. When, when we're, I'll be more explicit about why I'm asking this question in a minute, but when we're planning our workforce, we, we look at it post by post, there's no general assumption about how much a, a post at the GLA costs. Is, is there an average, in fact? Is there an average cost? I don't mean salary, because I've seen... Yeah, there is. It's, uh, uh, I'm not talking about salary. I'm talking about uh, total cost, uh, on cost. per yeah, post. We do then, onto the salary, we then add on the, the on costs. Yes, but I'm asking for an average cost per post in the GLA today. Well, it's going to be the average salary plus the employer's contribution to pensions and... Yes, I, I understand average, what goes into it. Yeah. I'm asking you what the average cost is. It's going to be, in it's going to be approximately 23% higher than the average cost of the salary. Yes, but uh, sorry. I'm asking you what the average cost is today across the GLA family group. Family group? So, no, no, sorry, the GLA. So we, I'm obviously not making myself clear. I've asked this question three times. Um, we have an establishment of 1,140 posts. Yes. 953 people are employed. Yes. The rest are being recruited at the moment. What is the average cost per post in the GLA today? I'll have to give you the details. Okay. I, can give you, I can give you the average employment cost, but you're, you, I presume you're asking for all, all overheads. Yes, so the average cost per post. Yeah. Okay. Calculate that. 
Okay. So we had 897, it says in, in, this, in paragraph 4.6. Po- Sorry, no, yes, eight, I lost my place. 897, oh, it's in paragraph 4.4. 4. 897 full time posts, that was the establishment figure in 2016. The establishment figure is now 1,140, and the mayor's budget that is before us is asking for a further 92. Have I got those numbers right? So that would take the establishment up to 1,232, which is an increase of 37% in the establishment in two years. What's the cost of that? Is that another figure you're going to have to come back to me on? I haven't got it to hand, but I can certainly write and provide that. Yeah. The, the, the cost of our salary budget, the increase of our salary budget over the period. Mm. Yeah, I think it would be useful to yeah. have that, particularly with the, the budget process ongoing. Yeah, happy. Okay. I saw Assembly Member Devnish. Thank you, Chair. I mean, my question, I'm astounded we haven't got these figures to hand. I mean, in your slides, you say the average salary 2008 to 2018 is £50,316. So are you saying you add 23% on cost to that figure and then multiply by the number of posts? It's that simple, isn't it? That, that will give you the, the, the staff cost. I think the chair was also asking for about other overheads on top of that. Well, yeah, absolutely, and so am I. I mean, you probably saw in the paper this week that TfL have had to admit that their figure is £83,000 on average, which seems a ludicrous figure in my opinion. So clearly we should be able to figure out what it is for the GLA. I, I don't know what's included in the in the TfL figures. I can't actually comment on that. I think what would be useful, Mr. Clark, if, if we can, breakdown. yeah, if, if we can do the usual exchange of letters and have that breakdown in there, I think it's probably pretty clear what members are looking for. Well, could I, could I help, exactly maybe that. help, Chair, because um, having done this a few times, particularly in Westminster City Council, what would be really helpful is also an illustration, because I think we, those of us who work in local government, understand, because often we hear what terms and conditions are. There's also a lot of rumours out there. So often what we do in Westminster Council is we have a nice illustrated picture that shows that people get paid a salary, they get paid holiday, they get paid pensions, they get many other additional perks. And it goes back to the point the HR member made that if you do this, you'll absolutely be able to recruit people because actually they are quite generous packages. But sometimes, uh, and my, my leader in Westminster has been, been uh, banging on about this quite rightly, that for example she's pushing maternity pay and most people even in the council didn't know how generous our maternity pay was and when you actually spell it out you increase recruitment of women you know which is obviously a good thing so it is about first of all transparency on what actually do we remunerate people in this building and I'm always amazed at the local government, we seem to have trouble. It takes several letters before we get this information. So that's all the chairman and I are asking. Well, how do you make up your remuneration, break it down on average per employee? Um, well, yes, Charmaine? Let Martin go first. I was saying this is the first time I've had uh, that specific uh, question uh, because all the staffing reports come through. We always include the employers on costs. Uh, uh, it is true we don't uh, add the other some areas that will be marginal costs which will give you know, uh, interest free uh, interest free yeah. season ticket loans as we uh, put in uh, the budget paper the way to the budget performance <coughs> committee uh, in November going forward we're going to identify all the additional uh, costs that f- would fall on support services for increasing headcount. We've heard uh, that we increase um, capacity around IT, ra- uh, ra- 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 around recruitment. But I, I, I can easily, I can write an e- write a, I yeah. a straightforward table of right. I, I think the stimulus of the employee that person. I think the stimulus, Mr. Clark. I mean, this is the first time members have been. Th- there's been a general feeling that staff numbers are increasing here. Um, but this is the first time that members have been presented with a number, and I think it's quite a surprising number to most members. Um, hence, there's inevitably going to be questions around cost and how it's full, not least um, about space as well, which is uh, conversations have been had on that subject in other rooms, in other circumstances, as most of the people here are, are familiar with. Um, so this, this line of questioning shouldn't be a surprise. 
um, and I suspect will continue. Charmaine, you wanted to um, come in as well? Yes, I just wanted to um, um, uh, comment on the uh, Assembly Member Devonish's points around uh, additional terms and conditions. So yes, um, we do offer a range of additional terms, for example, uh, maternity pay. Also, more recently, I've briefed Assembly Member Berry and uh, Assembly Member Pigeon today on policies such as our neonatal policy, provincial birth policy, but of course those costs will only be drawn down in certain circumstances where those individuals do that. So whilst it's part of our overall um, terms and conditions and has a cost attached, it's, um, it would be difficult to, to average that out, but I'm sure there are, are ways to do that. I think that's probably that's a presentational thing, isn't it? I, mm -hmm. I think there are ways of presenting that to members where you can you know, put an asterisk on it and explain when this would apply and when it wouldn't. Um, but some of the other costs are much more fixed and much more certain, aren't they? So I think that can be. Yeah. Come on to another. I'll, I'll drop that one and come on to another, another point. On 1.9 of your uh, GLA draft budget annex, you say something which frankly always does rather great with me having been in the public sector quite a while when it says here, I quote, early analysts, analysts suggest that in line with good employment practice, approximately 30% of, of them, i.e. Uh, those on fixed terms, should be made permanent rather than remain fixed terms. Um, if somebody works in an organisation for a year or two, I think there's an awful lot of evidence out there that they are often more keen, more enthusiastic, just generally more on the ball than if they're here forever or anywhere forever. So when you say that it's best practice, for example, you're not including that they have substantial long-term pensions liabilities if you have somebody here forever rather than if you have somebody here. And much of what we do in the GLA, it has a peak and then it the next mayor, dare I say it, or even this mayor, changes priorities, and therefore you may not need that particular individual. So when you make that kind of sweep in statement, would you like to reflect whether you, in all circumstances, believe it, or whether some of these people, or the majority indeed, for flexibility should remain on fixed terms contracts, rather than going on to the uh, permanent GLA roster? So our fixed term contract uh, contractor balance has remained fairly stable at around 23-24% of the overall population for the last two or three years. I think um, you're right that all, uh, individuals may want to leave and secure new roles. Um, looking at turnover, um, we have a uh, turnover around 16%, one percentage point higher than the public sector average, which I think does point to a reasonable amount of churn in the organisation and that also points to, which is why we have challenges on recruitment. Um, I think there is a balance to be struck between uh, the um, stability that permanent staff bring to an organisation and allowing a balance of staff who will be brought in for shorter term contracts on specialist skills where we need them, but then we expect them to leave. Um, that would also be a potentially attached to uh, some of the projects such as the one that uh, Jeremy presented uh, earlier uh, around where funding may be drawn from different sources and is finite. So I think there's, um, I, I do, we, we have heard clearly though through some of our engagement with staff through our all staff briefings that, um, that fixed term contracts do bring uh, some instability to staff. Um, they can't plan for their longer term futures, they're looking for uh, to progress their careers within the, um, the authority, um, so there are some negative impacts that um, also. I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Arnold. Um, yes, Chair, I've got a number of questions and this is the only committee that can be asked at. I uh, thank uh, members for um, staying. Um, the, um, can I just start with the pay gap analysis? Uh, both for gender and for um, uh, ethnicity. Uh, can you just give me a brief update? When are we likely to see, because um, this report is talking about really work in progress. I mean, I was asking the mayor in 2016, when he took over, about this issue. He did the, um, the audit following um, that request, and it, I, I don't get a sense that it's now part and parcel of business. So, when will we see action on so, the known um, 
gender and the known ethnicity gap that exists across the group. Um, alongside, when we published the 2017 data earlier this year, so we were publishing uh, one year behind, we, um, <coughs> we published a gender pay gap action plan um, alongside that, uh, uh, along, along with um, the other GLA group bodies. So, so it's been implemented now? Yes, it's been, it has been implemented along the way. since uh, we've had, It actually existed before we published the, the, uh, the gender, that particular set of gender pay gap data because the uh, uh, mayor announced uh, the first set of uh, gender pay gap uh, analysis pre the statutory guidance. Um, so that is... Um, uh, we have got good, very positive buy-in from the women's network and the other staff networks on that action plan. Um, uh, some of that you'll have seen already through some of the new policies, such as the premature birth policy that we've put in, um, and the investment, particularly, for example, in the um, talent programme to support uh, women into leadership roles, which is the Our Time programme, which I think uh, I spoke about in July, but since then, in September, we have launched... We have 34 women from across the GLA group matched with uh, champions um, and that's now in train and they will have um, a uh, six month managed development program with six months more, more of sponsorship. So it'll um, be about a year before we can actually see... Can I just intervene? Ever so briefly, I don't want to yeah. interrupt your flow too much. Yeah. Um, Assembly Member yeah. Devonish has just uh, indicated to me he needs to leave at 5.30 for another appointment. If one more member leaves the room, we're in court and we'll not be able to complete the meeting. So I'm just alerting members to the fact that we need to get through this by 5.30 if we can, otherwise we won't be able to finish. Okay. Same with Marano, back okay. to you. Yeah. And maybe we put this item first on oh, the agenda yes. next time. Or, well, indeed. Yes. Um, or, indeed, perhaps if there are things that we don't get to, we could uh, yeah. pick up in writing. That definitely. Um, so, so that's good. And I, I'm aware of the programme you talked about, so we'll be able to see some... The, the work that's going on through that in about a year. And to finish the, uh, the, your question, um, uh, Assembly Member, it uh, we also have, uh, are building an ethnicity pay gap action plan. Right. Um, in the last six months, we've established and supported a new staff network, a BME network. Yes. Um, all the networks sit around our Diversity and Inclusion Management Board, the decision-making body which our Chief Officer chairs. And together with them and with Unison, we've populated and created the action plan that we're seen to publish um, it's so important because I still walk around this building and the proportion of white males at meetings is two thirds if not greater than not um, the females white males. Not here. And, uh, and in terms of um, <laughs> diversity it's still um, not um, a representation when we think of the economic pool that you're working to is about 36. So to see teams working um, in this building that are no way representative gives me heartache. But that's maybe a personal thing. Um, I can just, may I just say you did, you did. I think you asked a question something like, "When is this going to become business as usual, or is this business as mm. usual?" Yeah. It's certainly absolutely top of my agenda mm. because yeah. I agree with you. You know, mm. representation. We we have a uh, an unacceptable imbalance. Of Mm -hmm. And you know, mm -hmm. we need to change that. Well, I'll look into you, Mary. Um, and um, the, the other thing was, um, uh, of course, there's work to be done because you gave us a chart on page 108 talking about, just talking about BAME employees for the moment, where if you look at that, um, tracking from 2008, mm -hmm. they were clearly the awful years between um, 2010 and 2015 or so. And um, then there was a, a great spike, and now we're at about 25%. Um, mm -hmm. um, when you then you look at um, reasons for leaving, mm -hmm. um, is that related to BAME staff? Oh, no, then you've got a chart. Yeah, so BAME staff then are disproportionately represented in staff leaving City Hall. Aren't they? If you look at your 20 odd percent of BAME staff leaving, mm. and I'm just wondering, are you unpicking that? Yes, so to, we to find out about unconscious bias, a new name for institutional racism that um, may be present within so teams. Uh, we have standard uh, processes for capturing exit interview data. Um, 
I think there's more that we can do on that assembly member on, you know, in terms of how we capture that and how we analyse that data. I think it also tracks back to the comments I made earlier around making sure that we have, an, a, it's not just about representation, but an inclusive culture. So once we attract people in to the organisation, they feel that they can progress their careers with us. Um, we had um, uh, looked at, senior managers have all had um, some learning on unconscious bias. Uh, unconscious bias. We want a much uh, wider rollout of uh, 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 to give people an individual strategies to tackle that across the whole organisation. That procurement has now been done, so we're shaping what that will look like, look like particularly with managers. Uh, and managers have a very big impact on staff. There's, you know, there's often a saying that people leave an organisation, not because of the organisation, but for the, the manager that they have. So how can we make sure managers are building inclusive cultures? And uh, since Mary's chief officer has arrived, um, every uh, 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 assistant director has now had to put in place and build a diversity and inclusion local action plan and all uh, senior managers have a diversity inclusion standard objective which was inserted into their um, performance objectives um, this autumn for at the mid-year point. Excellent, good, good to hear. I mean, to, just to let's touch on people with disabilities, I mean, uh, it's uh, woeful, aren't we? And uh, it just needs, um, I, I recently um, visited uh, an enterprise centre and they did some really great work in sort of like looking at jobs and, and looking at them outside the norm and say what are, what are the aspects of these jobs that can be done by someone with a disability rather than saying this job can't be done. Do you see what I mean? So reversing the thinking and if you like creating maybe three part-time you know or reduced hours jobs making the components doable by people with a particular disability. Um, are you thinking along those lines? Because that's so necessary. Because you're down at something like 4%, where across London, people have been doing this now and are at 12%. I think, I think it's fair to say we've got lots of work to do in disability. Um, the fact that we've only just established a disability network, I think, points to the fact that maybe staff didn't really feel that they... just... Yeah, so in the last uh, month, month, yeah, in the last month, and that's not us, it's not about managers establishing the network, but staff coming forward to say they feel confident now under this agenda and under the, the commitments that we've given. So, for example, that was really the um, on the back of um, us ensuring that every staff network has, now has an executive director as their sponsor. David sponsors the Women's Network, uh, Emma Strain, the LGBT Network, and uh, Sarah Mully positioned herself without the network in place as the champion, and, and someone's come forward to do that. Um, uh, I led a meeting uh, recently with um, a consultant who has a disability himself to give us some <laughs> advice on how to get started. Um, the disability confident um, scheme is where we need to start um, and we need to uh, build the network to help us deliver that. And that's everything from reasonable adjustments but also <coughs> the facilities that staff see, so how they enter. Uh, um, and I've had um, positive feedback. There's been staff who have uh, disabilities who've come forward and said that they, their experience has <coughs> been a good one, but we need to um, set that out more clearly to attract staff in. And of course we know, and you'll, uh, you'll know this assembly member, that um, unlike maybe some of the other diversity declarations, <coughs> uh, disability has some stigma attached to it. Yes. So we know that staff will be less um, confident about making those declarations on our systems. But that's why the environment and the policy <coughs> yeah. thinking and the leadership. Right. And, and thank you, Mary. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are recommended to note the report. Do we agree to do that? Yeah. Thank you, members. Um, item 10 is the work programme um, for the remainder of this year. Can we note that? I noted. Uh, the date of the next meeting is the 30th of January 2019 at 10 o'clock in yep. the chamber. Uh, item 12, any other business that I consider to be urgent, there isn't any, so I'll tell the meeting closed. Thank you. Thank you.